Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as Colin has alluded to, I'm, I'm sort of, shall we see it, slightly here under false pretenses, not being called Philip Robinson. But uh, please bear with me. This is a shortened version of a, of a tunnelling talk that we generally give. Um, so I may actually rattle through some parts of it, but I'm hoping that uh, um, there'll be enough for people who don't really know anything about tunnelling mining to at least take away with you um, something about it. So I'd like to just start the presentation really with... Um, a short clip taken from the Imperial War Museum uh, inventory of, of First World War material. Um, an indeterminate mine, and we don't really have any evidence where that is, but it gives you the, the idea of the scale. Um, the talk is on Great War Tunnelling and Mining, um, an introduction, um, and I'll actually go through, this is a slight deviation from, from Philip's talk, but I just want to put two or three concepts on the table, really, or on the lectern, I should say, um, before we move forward on it. Effectively, when we talk about underground warfare, we're talking about three concepts, living, moving, and fighting. Now, at the end of the day, all underground warfare, to some extent, boils down to these three concepts. Sometimes it's a bit more of one, sometimes it's a bit more of the other. But effectively, if we just take very briefly uh, a sort of an illustration of these three types, uh, I'll move more into the talk about, um, which is really where our speciality in the Duran group lies, which is in the, the fighting systems. This is a typical German, should we say, dugout, or maybe atypical, but it shows you the length to which the Germans actually armoured their dugouts and their underground features. <coughs> so from without, this is a rather stylized look at uh, the bell of Beaumont Hamel, um, a rather sleepy German soldier in there, showing, if you like, the scale of what the, they were living in underground. Now, I think this is quite fanciful in, in places. I think that is probably more likely the kind of get-up that you, you've actually got there. Is it, this British soldiers actually living in a cave, in a billet. Could be anywhere on the Western Front. Part of the stereoscopic photographs that were actually uh, introduced during the time. Um, that's probably more likely what it's like to work underground, a field dressing station, Australian troops. Um, I believe in the Hill 60 area, but Peter will know much more about it than I will. So living underground, people went down, it's the safest place to be. Um, moving underground, we have to get from where we live to the surface, we have to get from different places underground to different places. So here, for instance, is the light railway moving towards the cutaway, the cut, if you like, of the Hythe subway just outside Lewes. Now, it's a bit, of, a bit of an innocuous photograph. It's just a light railway. That's a cut and cover feature. It goes much deeper underground later. But this photograph is actually taken at Foss 7. It's called Charing Cross. Again, it's a, an Australian War Memorial um, photograph. It's not, as it says in the Imperial War Museum, the Hullock Tunnel. It is Foss 7, which is further south near Double Crassier. But that gives you an idea of the scale of the space that you need underground to actually move when you've got kit, i.e. trains, what have you. So we come to our third facet, fighting underground. Um, again, another post photograph, third Australian tunnelling company at Hullock. Um, very post photograph, as much of them were. Um, you can imagine how difficult it was getting cameras of any sort down uh, underground, especially in a fighting condition. Um, Two photographs from the German side showing the timbering that's needed in, in various aspects of the German tunnels. And a proto man actually in a, another post photograph rescuing a, a comrade from a collapse. So again, the fighting side of it, um, the fighting tunnels you can see much, much more narrow, sort of pokey in that respect. Um, so you've got the three basic facets. So let's come on now to how we effectively work, uh, um, we started our work in here. We, the, the, the point about the fighting underground is where did it come from? So if you think that the Western Front uh, stretched from Newport on the coast 
to the Swiss frontier with various, um, should we say, hot spots in between. You can see up there, coming right down through Ypres, Arras, Albert, Albert, the Somme, Verdun to the Swiss frontier. So 400 miles, um, actually, in total. Um, the French, we believe, were the first in the field in the Argonne on the November the 14th to actually sort of start sinking mines against the Germans. So the first strike by the Germans, 20th of December at Festibert, 10 small mines under the trenches of one of the Indian brigades, actually new to the front. Um, effectively, panic bells were actually started, and GCHQ um, actually got involved, and, and the call was out for the miners. So the presiding genius behind all this was a chap called Norton Griffiths. Again, most of you will be familiar now with uh, the history behind this. And he established the British Expeditionary Force Mining Companies. This is him with his famous Rolls-Royce. Um, he was a member of parliament. He was also an engineering entrepreneur. And he was also a Boer War associate of Field Marshal Lord Kitchener. And he previously proposed to the War Office that they should form a corps of moles, he called them. And they were based on employing specialist tunnelers um, called clay kickers who worked in the sewers, some of them worked in the sewers of Manchester and certainly under London. Um, so the next slide shows you an illustration of clay kicking at work. Um, the cross um, of the clay kicker as he sits on the cross and digs, all the effort actually going into the back at the point where it's at its strongest. So effectively, um, the idea that it would be propped there and all, all the strength, if you like, needed to actually dig out the clay or in that particular instance would be, would be in the right area of the back. Um, obviously, chalk would be different. This is, a, this is a clay scenario. OK, formation of the tunnelling company. So 170 uh, kicked off the first tunnelling company. Um, first group of clay kickers recruited in Manchester on a salary of six shillings and sixpence a day, which if you think that the... The Queen's shilling was what was given to the, to the infantry man of the day, was an enormous sum of money. You can understand why some of them were quite keen to actually take up the offer. Um, interestingly enough, that there was, to some extent, there was quite a bit of, um, shall we say, un unease amongst some people that they were getting paid so much. But they arrived at the Royal Engineer Depot at Chatham on the 18th of February. Saturday the 19th, they embarked for France. One day, 20th for Flanders. And the 21st of February, they entered the front line and started tunnelling. So, you know, effectively, is this a record for the recruitment, formation and operational deployment of any military unit, let alone a tunnelling company? Um, I can't necessarily see that happen today. But having said that, it, it's in context with the mobilisation of the British Expeditionary Force in 1914, which, which when, when you actually look at it, was impressive, to say the least. Um, the organisation from June 1916, so bearing in mind we're coming six months now into the, um, into the, to the, the programme of, of tunnelling companies being formed. Um, we had a proper staff actually formed, a Brigadier General Controller of Mines with the staff, um, all the geological and medical advisors. Each army, four and then later five, had Lieutenant Colonels usually, Controller of Mines for that particular uh, army. Uh, and then each army would have its own mine school. Um, 33 tunnelling companies, very quickly, you've, you've got um, imperial tunnelling companies numbered from 170 through to, I think, 258, uh, 259, 258, but there was a gap in between, so it doesn't necessarily account for it numerically. Three Canadian, three Australian and New Zealand, and the, uh, should we say, rather stylishly titled Australian Electrical and Mechanical Mining and Boring Company, called the ABC, or Alphabeticals, they were known as. Um, all the first, shall we say, 32 were actually tunnelling companies per se. The Australian Electrical Mechanical Mining Boring Company provided most of the electrical lighting, as you'd expect, but generally they powered the tunnels. So think of them as being the powerhouse behind the tunnels, although, of course, all tunnelling companies have that capacity to a certain extent. So, tunnelling companies, all bad. Finalised establishment, 18 officers, usually, with a medical officer, junior ranks, 550. Um, generally speaking, anywhere between four or five hundred men from infantry units actually attached at any one time. Um, and one of the places that we find an enormous amount of information when we're looking at how things work 
is not just to go to the tunneling company diaries, but to go to all the other diaries as well, because frequently there's a lot of cross-reference between, between the whole thing. And here we go. Peak July 1916 to 17, between 30 and 40,000 men on the British side. Um, 120 to 150 people digging and mining at any one time. So, and I think Harvey's estimate of 125 miles per tunnels is probably quite, quite um, should we say, it's a minimum estimate, I imagine, in that sense. So that's the scale of it by war's end. Obviously, in 1917, when the need for tunnelling um, actually lessened considerably, uh, the amount of infantry would have dropped off completely, and the tunnelling companies were then redeployed to other things. So the German structure, very briefly, um, we had, a, a, obviously, 33 tunnelling companies, if you include the, the, the ABC company. Um, initially, they came from the mining companies from their own field pioneer companies. Um, they didn't have specialist tunnelling companies in that respect. Uh, not until April 16 did they form specialist mining companies um, and the basic organisation, just four officers and 240 other ranks. Um, we presume, although we don't know, uh, that they used similar infantry for some of their work. So by mid-1917, there were 46 German companies and about as double that in terms of pioneers. So quite substantial. I mean, we, we thought of that in our terms, but they were half the size of our company, or in some ways, poss possibly even a third the size. Tactical control, mostly local, at divisional level. Um, they tended to stay where they were. Our companies tended to stay very much where they were. One company, I think 170, actually stayed virtually at loose salient um, for most of its time at the front. Others moved around slightly, but uh, generally you wouldn't have gone more than two or three areas. Um, the German, Germans tended to stay. And here we have hotspots. Um, effectively, your hotspots going from Ypres, uh, sub substantial tunnelling, although at a limited scale, at Newport on the coast in the dunes, um, but obviously the conditions are very difficult there. So the clay of Flanders, obviously um, very difficult to, to, to deal with, but as you come down further towards uh, Festubert and Hullock, you're picking chalk up as you move down into the deep systems. And then, obviously, further down towards Arras, you're, you're almost totally into chalk, um, as far down as the Somme. Um, and that would be the, the British line. Um, I would leave Peter to talk about the geology. I'm not a geologist. Um, I don't know enough about it to actually expand on that. And Peter will be giving you a much. But effectively, that gives you an idea of the geology of the area. Um, and how it changes from Newport down to Vimy Ridge at least. Certainly the Somme would be extra. But you can see that the way that the chalk actually uh, gives way to the clay, or should we say the other way around, the blue clay gives way to the chalk with the coal seams around Lons. So, looking at mine warfare, we're still in fighting underground at the moment. We've, not got, we've, we've done a little bit of the, the living, we've done a little bit of the moving as an introduction, but we're going to concentrate really on the fighting underground because effectively... Once the battle line's established and the armies actually uh, got themselves into a position where they could stand off, the logical thing was to go underground. If they couldn't attack each other and, and gain each other across the surface, um, the Germans actually started going under first, but effectively we went into a defensive mode with our mines. Now, mine warfare, you've got offensive, defensive, tactical, and two types of mine, a common mine, a fugas mine, and then you've got defensive and tactical. I'll come on to these three in a bit more detail. Um, this is a little bit of animation that we, we play that, that does very well in schools, particularly. Um, it's it's, uh, <laughs> effectively, it's a bit simplistic, but it gives you a, a kind of nice idea, if you like, in, in terms of, of, of what we actually have. But this is the process of, of, of digging a common mine. So that's the typical plan of the layout. And that's the effect, the desired effect. <laughs> so a common mine designed to blow up the enemy. Typical mine would be Hawthorne Ridge, 1st of July, um, obliterating the, the actual <coughs> German positions under the Hawthorne Ridge. Uh, similar mines were fired all across the Western Front and also indeed on the Somme. Um, a mine crater at Le Brazel. Peter will be expanding, I'm sure, of that on a much, much fuller basis. Um, again, a common mine designed to blow up very, very deep, very, very large quantities of explosives. 
Then we have a food gas mine, which is slightly different in the sense that it's designed to do a different thing. It's designed actually to bury the enemy. It comes from the French term. Um, the old type of food gas would be to actually cover the enemy with rubble or whatever. But the idea is you don't particularly want to actually blow the ground so badly that you can't actually traverse it. So very often a food gas mine might be fired in order to actually um, keep the ground available. Simple. That's an example of a food gas mine. Uh, it was so good I named the company after it. Um, the Durand mine that we actually, uh, Philip in fact himself actually uh, had a look at way back in 88 um, and we were in a position to defuse um, in 98, 10 years later. Um, it's a story in itself, um, effectively to cut, it, to cut the long story short, what we thought was a fairly inert mine of um, six and a half thousand, um, sorry, 2,700 kilos of amyl um, turned out to be a fully working mine with seven out of its eight primers and detonators still fully in working order. Um, 2,700 kilograms, and that was the first, shall we say, experiment in defusing mines done by uh, Colonel Watkins before his death, sadly. Um, and, of course, we named the, the Duran Group after this tunnel, a French tunnel originally, but taken over by the British. This is a British mine. So, defensive canoflay. This is the, 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 the th one of the third um, aspects of it. Different kettlefish completely. Different, different reasons for having this. Um, above and below. <laughs> so... Enemy tunnel damaged or completely blown in. The idea is to stop the Germans from undermining you as opposed to actually blowing them out of the ground or covering them on the surface. So this was mine fighting by mine fighters aimed at each other rather than the infantry on the top. Uh, a good example of a, a camouflage, P73G3. They're snappy titles, these mines, I have to say. The P73G at, at Vimy, uh, again a British mine laid by... Um, Richard Briscoe of 172 Tunneling Company. This is Colonel Mike Dolmore actually just having um, defused that particular mine, a little a canny little 600 pound charge at the end of a listening gallery. Interestingly enough, when we got into T19, the German system, um, almost seven years later, we could actually hear each other in the German system from this chamber by singing uh, nursery rhymes. <laughs> Uh, and that is the ST1921 system opposite P73G3. Here's some montage of photographs showing the state. You've got the um, German gallery here, close timbered, even in chalk, but some very dodgy chalk, nicely cut tunnels, and obviously the engineering involved that we had to use to get down it. And some of the artifacts, a complete generating chamber, German generating chamber, and of course the ubiquitous mashes strewn around all over the place. Moving on from how do you actually get your people out? So mines produce carbon monoxide if they're blowing. Um, a back blast from a mine might actually come right the way through a deep defensive system. Um, proto men would be used, specialist engineers, um, who would be used to get the miners out. They had their own dugouts, they had their own equipment facilities. Um, m most tunnels would have it. Here, for instance, you've got practice which establish a mine rescue station about every 1,000 yards underground. Um, this gentleman, Eugene Kelly, unfortunately killed in April 1918 um, in the Hullock Tunnel. Here we have an example of a listening device, a uh, geophone, uh, used, commonly used along with size microphones uh, to listen for the enemy. So the tunnels were in a position where um, it's no to fight him, you've got to find him. And from that point of view, listening was critical. Um, and we're in a position where, just looking at that diagram, you've got a position where interception, tunnels, posts, listening posts, quite a complex way of actually trying to look for the enemy. So, tactical mines. Purpose could include denying ground, creating obstacles, blocking enfilade fire, advancing position, and providing higher rims to overlook the enemy. So, here you've got a mine position. <laughs> a 
it does irritate me. <laughs> the German troops were far better at, at rushing craters and they, until really until the, the 1917, um, they, they constantly got a grip on it. And in fact, fired quite a lot of mines to actually um, better their own positions. One example at uh, the T19, T21 uh, crater, which we call washing machine crater at Vimy. It's actually got a cooker at the bottom of it, but for some reason our, our ex-chairman thought it was a, a washing machine, so we called it that. Um, it was actually a big tactical mine fired by the Germans themselves to extend their line uh, and create a defensive lip. So here we've got another form of, of, of mine pushing, a boring drill, which is used to push a, a, a wombat mine. Again, often to create a trench going through the front line so that infantry could advance uh, with a covered side either, either way. Um, effectively employed, by, particularly by the Australian companies. Okay, intensity. I'm going to briefly go through this because I, I know time is ticking. Um, June 1916, a big bunch along the lines, 101 mines, 126, a total of 227 mines, one every three hours. That gives you the scale of the intensity on here. This just gives you an idea. I, I was going to show you some anim animation of, of how a mine system works. This is in two-dimensional mode. This is anatomy of the Folly mining system at Vimy, showing you all the uh, fighting tunnels, listening galleries. And we have here particularly the main lateral. Um, when, the, when the British went down, they linked a lot of the individual systems together uh, with a lateral. Um, then they actually pushed inclines down into those laterals so they could get material in and out and men in and out. And the listening galleries or the fighting galleries themselves. And we, we use the word interchange because a listening gallery could eventually have a mine in it and then become a, a, a gallery that effectively would fight in that respect. And intersected by two subways, infantry conduits. So here we've got another facet. We've got the fighting systems actually with, and we have covered tunnels, large tunnels moving from rear to forward lines, carrying troops, carrying materiel, um, effectively fueling, taking out material, pushing men in to the front line. Um, these are the moving underground facets um, which augment the actual fighting aspect of it. Um, here gives you an idea of the Lafolly tunnels, what sort of tunnel a fighting system looks like. Top left there, all the timbering still in, flooded water, trolley rails, and you can see by the crouched gentleman there, can't remember who that is, it's probably Philip himself actually, that it's um, quite, quite crawly. Right, the noisy stuff, very briefly, um, what did they use to uh, fight each other underground with? Okay, explosives, by 1915 we were using aminal, a mixture of um, ammonium nitrate, and the Germans were using, French and Germans were using similar, um, they called it chedite or donorite or various forms of it, but they were all essentially the same, the same base, basis, which was sort of ammonium nitrate based. Um, primers were TNT blocks and or dry gun cotton. Uh, some t sometimes we, nitroglycerine and, and, and angelic nitrate were used. Nitroglycerine is, is um, shall we say, very sensitive and um, we're in a position where if anybody um, wonders whether or not these mines are actually safe. I think everybody's familiar with the 1955 mine that went up at Laguerre in Belgium. Um, in that instance, it gives, it gives the um, sort of a, a very good illustration of the fact that these primers and detonators are still quite live even after all these years. And the detonators themselves, um, fuse plane number eight, copper, electric number 13, mark three, obviously gone through a lot of stages of development to actually get to the use on the Western Front. Here we have a, a typical bag of aminal. I, I, I'd uh, like you to have a look at our stand behind the room, the auditorium at the end. We've actually got a real bag. Uh, you'll be glad to know that it's not got explosives in it, but effectively we're, um, we're, um, we, we've got the next best thing, which is scrunched up paper, basically. So this sort of situation here, we've got um, 175 Tunneling Company. Can you say whether you have made use of the aminal? If so, are the results satisfactory? So we have a little joke here, which is the sort of thing. <coughs> Reply from Fifth Corps, after much discussion. <laughs> you read it for the back, Andy. Read it for the back, sorry. <laughs> Can everybody see that? <laughs> so, moving on. 
This gives you an example. This is Butte de Wancourt, uh, sorry, Butte, Butte de Vercoir, um, down on the, the French front, uh, of what the landscape can say to you when you're looking at it from the air. This, this is like craters on the moon. We use this expression quite often when we're talking about First World War craters uh, and um, shell holes, uh, none more so than here down at uh, Vauquois. The Ypres salient and the Messine Ridge, another hot spot of fighting. Again, 1917, 19 huge mines fired in, in June the 7th uh, in support of the Battle of Messines. Um, effectively, though, apart from several instances, and this is one key instance, mining really didn't change the game for the infantry on the surface. Even despite firing 19 mines, the advantage still has to be taken by the infantry to, to take and hold ground. So we're still in a position where you can explode as many mines as you like underground. But once the infantry have moved over that ground, you're back to square one with your mining, which is why mining, in some instances, in some areas of the front, was so transitory, because the, the, the idea was not to stay, the idea was to move over. Of course, there are several areas where that never happened, and mining actually moved into siege warfare. So that gives you an idea of some of the leftover mines, just a few of them, and down at the bottom here, still left over, and the one that exploded in the thunderstorm. Uh, and that's the effect that happened in 1955. This photograph was given to me by a gentleman who lives in the house just about 100 yards from this spot. Um, and he invited me in for a coffee and, and said, I've got something to show you. And he was one of the little boys actually at the bottom of the crater. Uh, he'd be in his late 50s now. So moving underground very briefly, and we are going to be brief now. Two examples of subways, infantry conduits, the way we get from the rear lines to the front lines. Two conduits at Vimy Ridge, Cavalier and Tottenham. And you can see the elaborate nature of what we were putting in there. Effectively, all the subways that were dug for the Vimy battles had different, slightly different reasons for, for doing it. But they all had an entrance, a forward entrances. They all had rear exits. They all had intermediate points to actually come in. They all had services. They all had power. They all had railways within them. They all had billets. They all had latrines, field dressing stations. Some of them had command and control for infantry units. Um, effectively, what it meant was that the soldiers could get up front and personal to the battlefield, if you like, in relative safety without actually uh, being subject to the German bombardment. So that gives you an idea of the scale of the living and moving underground as we get forward. And that's what it's like in the Goodman subway. We're in a position where we found uh, water tanks, graffiti, of course, absolutely uh, masses of graffiti. Um, very little of it from the first day of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, as it happens, mostly from afterwards. Um, but it goes, that shows you the scale of what we're looking for and how we actually go about it. Um, probably the largest internal, I wouldn't say internal man-made structure in that sense, but m use of an internal structure at Wellington Cave, uh, Maison Blanche, David's going to speak much further uh, uh, this, this afternoon um, on Maison Blanche, so I'm not going to steal his thunder on that. But Wellington, that shows you the scale. Let's not forget 184 and 179 tunneling companies. The New Zealanders tend to get all the, 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 the praise for the, the Wellington uh, and the Arras caves. But sterling work by two, two companies from the UK actually did as much in one of the systems. But that shows you that the companies linking all these, these caves that were dug for other reasons, um, making use of them to actually aid in the Battle of Arras. Of course, once mining and tunnelling actually then moved elsewhere and the front decided to become more mobile, um, the tunnelling companies had less use in their old siege warfare capacity. So um, they became various experts in all of the things you see there, mine dugouts, demolitions, wells, laying light railways. They were multitasked, if you like, towards the end of the war from 1917 to 1918. Although, of course, some companies in those areas that didn't move right until the end of the war um, the tunneling companies still were, were within the remit that they were formed. Right, I'm just going to... Okay, that's my talk on general tunneling and mining. I, I do apologise if it's a little, a little rushed because it, it is, as I say, a, a, long, a much longer talk with more detail. I'm just going to, to, to mention um, a brief thing for two minutes um, because the Duran group have decided that, that for what we'll be doing for the next four years 
one of the things, the key, two key areas that we'll be concentrating on for the next uh, two years, which will encapsulate all of this, will be the loose salient underground, from the Labazé Canal to the double crassier at the bottom. Effectively, very briefly, um, down here, you've got Lons, the outskirts of Lons, moving up towards the Labazé Canal. Um, this was the Battle of Luz in 1915. Um, the idea was to drive the Germans back and also take pressure off um, the coal fields, which the French badly needed. Um, that gives you a little bit of a closer look around here. We've actually got um, the, coal, the village of Luz itself. This shows you the salient that was pushed out in the September battle for 1915. That shows you the mining map. And these are briefly, this is the mining front going underneath the, the village of Luz. The double crassier itself looks nothing like what it does today. It's much bigger today than it would be in those days. Have a look at this at the back when you get a chance for some coffee. This is basically our interpretation of the mining system going over the current uh, field. You'll see how the encroaching archaeology uh, potential here is, is becoming problematic for us uh, as more and more settlement is taken on there and industrial estates as well. Uh, again, a little bit closer detail. Red German, sort of greeny blue is the British systems. Not a very good resolution slide, but that shows you an industrial estate with the mine system going right underneath it. And each of those little orange pieces is, a, is an exploded mine. Um, so that tells you the ground we're dealing with here. Cop sector, this was the sector we've just been looking at. These are just a few of the images from underground. Um, we got into the deep, deep system. This is a multi-level system, three levels down, 112 feet. Um, at the bottom of it, we found um, railways, all sorts of things, partially underwater, four foot of water, but beautiful, pristine cut tunnel. To the northern end, three weeks ago, we've been investi investigating around Hullock and the Hohenzollern Redoubt, uh, again, part of the loose salient uh, operation that we'll be doing. And that's what the mining sector looked at, almost at this, this part. Again, Hullock from here, right up towards the Labazé Canal, going even more. Our interpretation of the same plan over a Google satellite, and I, this isn't the place to say this, but it's a very sophisticated um, way of actually trying to get information now. We, we bring all, all things to bear, and uh, all of us working either on the Somme or in Belgium or in loose battlefields are all employing the same techniques. And here's some pictures that we took two or three weeks ago, having broken into the Hullock St. Eli system. This system has the potential to move underground for seven kilometers from the Hullock to the Labazé Canal. Uh, we've reached several blockages, but that, they're engineering solutions, not, not problems. Uh, engineering challenges, I should say, not problems. And we are working very closely with the local communities to interpret this as part of the loose salient. So the plan for the Durand Group over the next four years is to completely interpret this battlefield, the Battle of Luz underground. Very last slide, most complete underground story potential, living, moving, and fighting. Think of those three concepts. Establishment, the battles are fought, you move underground. We defended initially against the Germans' onslaught, and then we began offensive-defensive. So we broke out from purely defensive mode and started taking the fight to the Germans. And then when the two sides could go no further at each other, and these particular fronts weren't going anywhere, not like the Somme, which moved on, not like, to some extent, other battlefields that moved on, but in the loose salient, this was, no, this was going nowhere. We began a substantial program of protected communication, including tunnels and billets. Um, effectively, we've now got this canvas on which to, to do our work for the next four years. So um, I'd just like to say this is the first time we've announced this, but we will be going, actually, uh, hammer and tongs now for the next four years. And thank you very much. I'm, I've been a bit longer than I should be. I'm very, very sorry, but um, Colin has um, sort of been looking at me with drawn daggers. But um, that brings my talk to the end. Please feel free to chat to my colleagues and, of course, uh, at any other time throughout the day. And David, of course, will be giving his presentation on Maison Blanche. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. A little town needs me to wear his patio. Things like Maloney wants to marry me and so. Leave the strand and pick a billy or you'll be to blame. For love has fairly drove me silly, hoping you're the same. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Farewell, let us swear. It's a long, long way to 
Lucifer. <laughs>